好像是很少。
गुड आफ्टरनून वेलकम बैक प्लीज सेटल यूवर सेल्फ एज अर्लीस्ट सो दैट वी कैन बिगिन विथ आर वेलिडिक्टी सेशन इन कपल ऑफ मिनिट्स मेंबर सेक्रेटरीज उत्तराखंड एस एल एस ए कुलबे जी प्लीज कम नियर द डायस मेंबर सेक्रेटरी तेलंगाना एंड मेंबर सेक्रेटरी पंजाब अरुण गुप्ता जी उधर से अंदर आ नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑनरेबल मिस्टर जस्टिस उदय उमेश ललित जी ऑनरेबल एग्जीक्यूटिव चेयरमैन नालसा 
ऑनरेबल डॉक्टर जस्टिस डी वाई चंद्रचूड़ साहब ऑनरेबल जज ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया एंड ऑनरेबल मिस्टर जस्टिस संजय किशन जी कॉल ऑनरेबल जज सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया ऑनरेबल लॉर्डशिप्स ऑफ द डायस ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स रिप्रेजेंटेटिव फ्रॉम एस सी बी ए स्कोरा एंड बी सी आई प्रेस एंड मीडिया द फर्स्ट ऑल इंडिया डिस्ट्रिक्ट लीगल सर्विसेज अथॉरिटी मीट वॉज ऑर्गेनाइज इन द सेवेंटी फिफ्थ ईयर ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस बाय नेशनल लीगल सर्विसेज अथॉरिटी before inviting our honorable executive chairman chairman may i take privilege to welcome uh, lordships so i invite shri arun gupta ji member secretary punjab to felicitate honorable mr justice lalit sir thank you arun ji now may i invite shri r k kulbe ji member secretary uttarakhand to felicitate honorable dr justice d y chandrachur sir thank you kulbe ji now may i invite shri gordan reddy ji member secretary telangana to felicitate honorable mr justice sanjay kishan ji call sir thank you gordon ji after in power packed inaugural session we had four technical sessions and this is a different type of valedictory session as designed by our honorable executive chairman nalsa so just to deliberate upon way forward i invite honorable executive chairman and request his lordship to kindly guide us my distinguished colleagues dr justice chandrachud and justice sanjay kishan call who are part of this session along with me my other distinguished colleagues justice rishikesh roy justice vikram nath justice narsimha the honorable chief justice of telangana justice ujjal boyan justices apresh kumar singh justice koteshwar singh mr vishwanathan who was participant in the earlier session today all the distinguished persons who are here the member secretaries of the legal services committees member secretaries of the district legal services committees chairpersons of the legal services committees members from the press ladies and gentlemen four very tough sessions tough in the sense lot of ideas getting thrown lot of suggestions which also came from this body the august body of gathering which is before us we were rather apprehensive that this is the first time that a convention or a conference of all district judges was being held so first and foremost how much would be the participation whether the district judges would be free to express themselves 
But all those inhibitions were right from first session onwards, were actually sort of kept at bay. And we could see very effective participation coming from all of you. Thank you so much. Now, the very uncommon way of having a valedictory address, rather than asking somebody to just give one way address, what we thought of was, I have been associated with this legal aid work as chairperson of NALSA for last almost 15 months or so. My successors are actually sitting next to me. So what is going to happen, we are actually setting before ourselves the vision for 2047. It's very difficult to have the contributors who can actually be contributing towards realization of that vision, but at least three of us are before you. And that's how the thought process to get, first of all, have clarity in the matter, devise a strategy, and then thereafter start implementing or realizing that strategy, at least in near future, so that that foundation will be available for the future generations to come. They say there is a very beautiful concept called intergenerational equity in environmental jurisprudence. That is what they say is that the shape of earth, the environment that you have inherited from your forefathers should be given at least in the same fashion to the next generation. So that's the intergenerational equity. I will actually put it a very slightly in a very rigorous tone, whatever we have inherited, we must shape everything in at least far better condition than what we have inherited and pass it on to the next generation of those who will be in charge of legal aid work. And that idea will get realized only and only if we channelize our resources have our strategies clear and work towards realization of the same. What has last one year taught us? You are, as was said in the inaugural function, you are the persons who work at the, what is called ground level or even grassroots level. So you know the pulse of those persons who actually are the seekers of legal aid, what kind of problems are faced by them, and how to tackle those problems, how to tackle some of these inconsistencies or the issues which get thrown up. I have had interactions with various sections, state legal services authorities, at times even district legal services authorities, wherever I have traveled. I have, on my personal note, I have gained quite a lot from those interactions with you. It is after those interactions that we could devise our strategies. Those strategies have worked to a great advantage, at least in one field, which is low kadalats. We have seen tremendous amount of disposal every low kadalat after the next one. So that's one front. Secondly, we tested our ability that whether we can, we set a goal for ourselves, that is to reach every village in the country at least thrice. In that awareness program spanning over 42 days, we could again show to ourselves that yes, we can do. We reached about 19.5 lakh villages. It is through our tremendous amount of effort that could, we could reach every nook and corner of the country. So what this entire body before me is what? This body has tremendous power, tremendous strength, tremendous substance, and of all great amount of effort which can be channelized in any fruitful direction. 
One more thing, and this is what I have always been saying. We have done this outreach program, we have reached very well every soul in the country, at least, you know, we tried to reach every village. But thereafter what? We are, by nature, judicial officers. We are not the dispensers of the legal aid. We are the facilitators of legal aid. So therefore, awareness will bring very well uh, a strength amongst those who are the seekers of the legal aid that perhaps there is this outfit, there is this system, there is this office which can grant me solace. It will give that awareness of the right that every man, every citizen has. But thereafter what? Thereafter, the legal aid must be dispensed with. And legal aid means quality legal aid. It is for us to assure that what we are granting, we are dispensing, is actually quality legal aid. How does one ensure? Now, in the morning session, some of the factual data was placed before you. Let's just analyze that data. If 70% of India's population is below poverty line, which means that they are a potential persons who require legal aid, they are the constituency that we are going to aim at. They are the persons that we are trying to reach out to. Very well, 70%. How many of them on criminal side are actually under the outfit of legal aid at pre-arrest stage, not more than 3%. At remand stage, not more than 8 or 9%. At the trial stage, not more than 17 to 18%. Now mark this. At the remand stage, 8%. At the stage of trial, about 18%. So where do we get those 10% from? the additional, they are the ones who at the initial stage are actually engaging private lawyers. If they are otherwise incapable, come from a strata where they cannot engage the services of a lawyer and they deserve legal aid, where do they get the money from? They actually sell off their properties, mortgage their assets, and it is through that source they actually keep engaging private lawyers. So therefore the marked rise from 8 to 18 percent and from 18 percent onwards, nothing. So therefore imagine that the gap between 18 percent and 70 percent, that's that 52 percent gap, people are, though they deserve legal aid, they are outside the umbrella of legal aid apparatus. Why? <coughs> Possibly because, and the lady who was sitting there in the back, she touched upon that point that there is a trust deficit. There is no trust, there is no inherent confidence in the apparatus of legal aid. And that's the point that we must address. Outreach and other things, we are exceptionally good at, you know, achieving that. We have various ideas of maybe having jingles, maybe having running kind of, you know, stories, running sort of pamphlets and other things. We can do that as judges, as legal aid services. But this trust deficit or lack of confidence is actually when it comes to dispensing of legal aid. And that lack of confidence is something that we must bridge that gap in coming years to come. How best do we do it? That is one of the ideas to achieve that result was, instead of having these remand advocates who, among other things, also do a brief or two every month by way of legal aid, what happens is that in this bouquet of matters that a person has, 
the matters concerning legal aid take the least priority and therefore the man will naturally sort of engage himself utilize his time to the best of his ability in pursuing those matters which are supposed to be which build his practice we can't find any fault with that kind of arrangement in the nascent stages in the early stages of legal aid movement we had to rely on such talent no difficulty about it but then sometime at some stage or the in the entire process we have to now branch off and do something else and that is why on the lines of what is called public prosecutors office we devised what is legal aid defense council so there will be a dedicated office there will be three or four persons working there who will be interested the entire legal aid work in the district the result will be they will not be sort of guided by any private practice for them legal aid work is the only thing that they are supposed to do maybe we may not have the best of available talent so therefore that is why the regulations that we have actually framed are they will give you tremendous amount of discretion in choosing the right persons i have always been saying that the youngsters who are in the profession the young lawyers they normally do not have exposure before the court of law or enough opportunities if an office such as legal aid defense council is available which completely backs them gives them enough upon amount of exposure or appearances those youngsters will be your backbone and they will be serving your legal aid movement like anything so therefore go for talent which is adequately compensated we have devised a remuneration kind of you know the minimum and maximum choice is yours discretion is yours have the best possible talent and then this apparatus this office will function as the nodal point why am i saying so there are legislations like domestic violence act there are legislations like wherever at the district level some kind of overseeing or monitoring is required to be done this office will function as the nodal point law ministry has initiated two two beautiful app, apps one is called nyay bandhu so therefore it is through these apps that constant kind of interactions will be encouraged constant monitoring can also be undertaken and this service will be available to the entire population we have also sort of guaranteed that e libraries will also be given to these district legal aid council so this office will be fully functional once that office is fully functional and with the right talent according to me this system will itself start bearing fruits and perhaps our results will be that more and more people will impose or repose confidence in the entire system if more and more people repose confidence then very very soon that gap between 18% and 70% you will be having something commensurate with the real picture that is who or whoever is supposed to be below poverty line at least that man can say with confidence that i can go to the legal aid dispensation clinic which will give me complete succor and solace according to me and that's how the our vision should be right to education act says that every child regardless of his station capacity earning capacity of the parents etc must have free education and education as decided by the supreme court is must be quality education not refrap so one part for every citizen is that he must be equipped he or she must be equipped with good quality education the second part that one must have by way of guarantee is that there is minimum amount of medical service available through the network of primary health care centers all across the entire nation and the third thing 
is this legal aid dispensation. Every citizen must have these minimum three facets which are guaranteed to him. If we have this legal aid movement taken to the logical end and say that what lies in future for us, it is to ensure that even if a person chooses the office of legal aid, he must have that inherent, inbuilt confidence that my matter will be done with utmost care and caution. It may be that the person concerned, the lawyer, may not be a front runner in terms of standing at the bar, but in terms of intellect, effort, the person definitely can match any kind of talent. And that is why I said, when we started this Legal Aid Defense Council system idea, I said, engage the youngsters who have that talent. They also need exposure. Utilize their services. Go one step further. Have the law students associated with the Legal Aid movement. I've always been advocating that every law college must adopt three talukas and keep sending its students who are in the fourth and fifth year as paralegal volunteers who will then have social interaction with the entire population in that three talukas. That will give, that will bridge the gap, that will teach those students what exactly is legal aid movement and they'll get imbibed in the culture right from day one. Another facet which always sort of, you know, bothers me, except medical education in this country, no other field of education thinks of any kind of internship where we give it back to the society. A medical student is supposed to be working in primary health care centers or taluka or district health care centers for at least about six months or so before he gets a degree. His services are utilized. We don't want to compel them, but if this idea is advocated, is this idea is projected all through, then the students will also get encouraged to join. If they, encourage, if they are encouraged to join as paralegal volunteers, that's the talent that will be before you in years to come. Very well, this is something so far as how best to garner the legal talent. For me, the vision for 2047 could be, we have completed 75 years of independence, 25 years of existence as legal aid societies. Those two early reports, one by Justice Bhagwati when he was Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court, there was a committee which was framed under his leadership, and one by Justice Krishna here, when he was judge of Kerala High Court, that's of 72, which was at the union level, they summed up everything that what legal aid actually ought to be. But those reports were in the days when there was hardly anything which could be described as dispensation of legal aid. It was virtually dependent upon the individual volition, discretion, and expertise of certain individuals, <coughs> not as an organized movement. We have come very far from that. Today we have the entire network right up to Taluka. We will soon be having what is called Legal Aid Defense Council. Every district will have this apparatus. So the situation that we were in 72, 73, we have now traveled miles beyond that. But our goal is still what that goal is. As I said, 18 to 70 percent. Those persons who are desirous, who deserve legal aid, going by the very fact that they come from disadvantaged sections of the society, must be given that sense of confidence. Awareness, etc. we have done that. We now have to travel beyond that. They must be given that sense of confidence, and that sense of confidence is something that we must aspire in years to come.
to give that sense. So that's one part. Second, since we have learned from our experiences over last about say 15 months or so through low Dalits, try to tap that as one more mode of solution of you know the pendency situation. In last 15 months we have finished or rather we have been able to dispose of three crore matters. Now out of three crore, two crore were pre-litigation stage. One crore was post-litigation. That was the pending matters. To certain extent, all of you have contributed quite a lot in seeing that one crore matters get disposed of and to that extent, pendency gets completely reduced. It is true in yesterday's session, one of the ideas which got thrown was, we judicial officers, we work from Monday to Friday. As it is, we are overburdened, correct? And then you expect us that we must also devote ourselves to see that local Dalits are successful. So therefore, my Saturdays and Sundays are also devoted to that trying to see that pre lokadalat sessions have some kind of interactions. It is true. It is true that yes, we are banking on that extra efforts, that extra mile that we are asking you to run. But all of us are running that. All of us are running with that sense of purpose. See, I also do on Saturdays, Sundays, I have been traveling like anything. In 42 days, I covered 16 states without taking a single day's leave. So it was only on Saturdays and Sundays. So whatever be the level, we have to do that. And we do it not by way of compulsion. We do it with what? That sense of purpose, that social cause behind that. And that's how, that is what which must impel us that is what which must propel us to move in that direction. Very well. So therefore, according to me, the momentum that we have gathered up till now for disposal of matters in low kadalat, we must sustain that. If we sustain that, to a certain extent, we will be helping in taking the slice out of you know, the pending areas. If we take out those areas from the regular docket, to that extent, you as judges, who are then, you know, manning a different hat, or wearing a different hat when you work as judicial officers, you will not be overburdened by the regular docket. Okay, so therefore that's what, according to me, Lok Adalat should also be given the same impetus in coming years to come. Then the third part, which was in today's session about the prison reforms. So since Justice Call actually touched upon that, I'll just say a few words and then leave the other things to be covered by my colleagues who are part of this particular chapter. See, as district authorities, you must be vigilant that for instance, one of the problems which was voiced was that very well, despite the orders, the persons are still lying there. Or one problem voiced by the lady who was sitting here that it is impossible for certain persons to give the bond. Now these are individual matters which you must also take care and to the extent possible as concerned SLSA or DLSA try to initiate the process so that corrective measures can be taken immediately. Apart from overcrowding the prison, which could be the infrastructural issues, one of the matters is that, very well, the bail issues are sort of, you know, taken not so seriously. They're kept in the background. But that's not for, directly for us. That's the judicial wing. It is true that we are the same persons I may sitting as a, as a judicial, while discharging my judicial functions on a particular fact situation, I may say that the man doesn't deserve bail. Or there could be statutory compulsions like, say, NDPS law, which says that a bail should not be easily granted. Or it could be Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribe uh, Act or POXO Act, 
legislation such as that. Whatever be the compulsions which you are supposed to work under as a judicial officer, they stand on a different footing. As legal aid apparatus, what is principally our job is to see that the man is not denied the opportunity of getting represented before a court of law and his matters or his submission that he is entitled to bail are also addressed timely by applications getting moved well in time. It is that part that is certainly within our command and which we will certainly do that. Prison reforms, yes, that's also a logic. How much of capacity the prisons are having, for instance, there are at least about 20 odd states where the prison population is more than 100%. So therefore, what if the capacity is 1,000, there are maybe 12, 1,200 people who are presently lodged in the prison. Such matters, yes, as DLSAs, as SLSAs, you must bring it to the notice of NALSA. We will start taking actions on that, correct? This is what I wanted to say for so far as the vision is concerned. Now, there are two facets, and that's the reason three of us are sitting here. My Lord Justice Chandrachud has the expertise when it comes to the what is called computerization or the e facet or virtual facets of the entire dispensation. He is in charge of e committee, which is now trying to see that entire processes through virtual platform. As one extension of that thought would be the legal aid sort of, you know, the, the one slice of the entire bread would be the legal aid matters. So of course it is in his domain. My Lord Justice Sanjay Kishan Call is in charge of mediation, so therefore that's also one facet which is, which is going to be a great tool in future. He has also worked on what is called what should be the approaches in bail matters. So therefore, I will refrain from touching upon those issues which my learned colleagues will certainly deal with that. At the end of it, I must say that it was very enriching experience to hear all of you, to have all of you here. At the same time, we normally work in our cocoon. Maybe as judges in the Supreme Court, we work with our colleagues who are actually, we have the interaction interface with our colleagues. Similarly, at your level, you must also be working in that limited sphere. These opportunities, conventions or conferences like this give you opportunity to have interaction with your colleagues from across the borders, across the state, we also learn from each other's experiences. You have also come here for the first time to a conference like this. We would welcome everybody's suggestion. And I would request all of you to put in your suggestions, your experiences of this conference in writing. And maybe in next seven days, please post them to NALSA. We'll certainly compile them, and whatever your suggestions are, we'll certainly note them and change our, or have our course correction to take care of your suggestions, okay? Thank you. Now, over to Justice Chandrachur. My very distinguished colleague, Honorable Justice Uday Lalit, my very distinguished brother, Justice Call, and all the participants and invitees this morning, including my colleagues in the Supreme Court, Chief Justice of the High Court, Judges of the High Court, and all of you members of NALSA and the State and District Legal Services Authorities. I would have been happy to begin my presentation this morning with what luxury a judge can afford, which is to say that I agree with the erudite judgment of Justice Lalit. But I think, you know, the luxury which I have as a judge 
I may not necessarily possess as a speaker. So I'll make a very small presentation on a subject which is very close to my heart. Well, I have been invited here as a self-confessed geek on technology with a sprinkling of knowledge of where technology is taking us, but an awareness of my own limitations when coping with technology, which is so rapidly evolving. But I do believe that the limitations of my knowledge I try to cover up by the sense of enthusiasm over technology. I want to address this, why technology? And what is the relevance of technology to the work which we do? And I'd like to briefly put across a point of view to you by look looking at the institutional aspect, whether it's the courts, the jails, the police stations, the forensic science laboratories. What is the core problem? The problem is the opacity of the institutions, whether ours or others in the state system. The second problem is lack of information. Look at it from the perspective now of the beneficiaries. From the institutional perspective, the lack of information, the opacity, leads to all the evils that we are so conversant with, and I need not dwell on them, whether it's in terms of lack of efficiency, arbitrary exercise of state power, or worse still, corruption. Look at it from the perspective of the beneficiaries. Most of the beneficiaries are illiterate. There's a lack of awareness about rights. This is compounded by a lack of resources. But overall, and above all, there is the disability itself of marginalization. Whether the marginalization be in terms of gender, whether it be in terms of caste, whether it be in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of lack of geographical opportunities, lack of education, or just socioeconomic want. So these are two ends of the spectrum, the might of the state and the position of the beneficiaries. Now, why technology? Technology, ironically, enables us to do something which the wings of the state don't do which is simply put, to talk to each other. So technology today has become a powerful interface for different wings of the state to be talking to each other. Now, how do we talk to each other and how do we benefit from the use of technology? First, there is a need for us to institutionalize our processes. Don't do it in an ad hoc way. When you see a problem, attend to the problem. When you see injustice, reach out to injustice. That is what we do as judges every day in our lives. That's our duty. But we have to go beyond, which is to institutionalize our processes. Second, set up systems and processes so that a case which falls in a paradigm is treated uniformly with all other cases in that paradigm, not dependent upon the individual or the person who happens to be there at that police station or that forensic science laboratory or that hospital. Third, bring about a sense of accountability for the decision makers themselves. Fourth, monitor implementation. How successful are we in terms of the control which we wield over public resources which are made available to our disposal? And ultimately, the object of doing this is to enhance quality, transparency, and access to justice. Now, what I want to posit this morning is that there has to be a shift in our thinking process in terms of our dialogue. And we must shift the stream from seeking justice, from a system which allows citizens to pursue their cause of justice, to a system which seeks out those for whom justice is meant by seeking out the beneficiaries. The burden then is displaced from the beneficiaries to those who are in charge of various facets of the administration of justice. Whether it be in terms of identification of the beneficiaries, 
creating a sense of awareness, or preparing a module, a module for, universal, for universalizing the delivery of justice. Now, just one statistic, the National Crime Records Bureau figures tell us that the number of under trials in 2020 was 371,848, up from 332,916 in 2019. You also have a situation, when I said why technology, you have 500 million smartphone users in India today. Now, while you have 500 million smartphone users in India today, which is an extraordinarily large amount, you also have 800 million who have no access to smartphones. That also emphasizes the importance of technology, but tells you the limitations of technology. We need to reach out through the 500 million smartphone users, but we also have to understand that the rest are still yet to come onto the uh, technology, or on technology. Now, having given you this broad framework, I want to tell you a few things which I obviously couldn't tell you yesterday, and now in the light of the discussions which have taken place over the last day and a half, to tell you where technology would lead us and what's our vision for the future. The core of the e-courts project, the core of technology in the Indian judiciary, is the case information software, CIS. We are on CIS 3.0, 3.2. We are now moving towards CIS 4.0. As the e-courts project is implemented, the entire district judiciary today is mapped on the core of the technology platform, which is prepared by the National Informatics Center. And there is a periphery, which is being developed by all the states. Some states are ahead of the others. But the core is the CIS platform, which we have prepared. Now, to my mind, the integration of the case information software with NALSA, the state, and the district legal services authorities will instantly make available court records and information of convicts and under trials to legal services authorities to process and monitor jail petitions, appeals, status of under trials, among other things. We are at present working in very close association with the National Informatics Center for upgradation of the present version of the CIS to CIS 4.0. Under trials are at the core of this development exercise as we move towards CIS 4.0. Now, some of the salient features which we intend to tap and which would be of great and immense value to the legal services movement is that there has to be a strong, as we call it in the ICT area, a strong handshaking mechanism between courts, prisons, and the police stations. Now, the facility is being developed to fetch information from prisons in CIS 4.0 and the updation of prisoner IDs in the case information system. In other words, what we need to plan on is not that the prisons should make available data to the legal services authorities, but that the legal services institutions must themselves be able to retrieve the data without the intervention of any state actor. In technological terms, the solution is very simple. You use what are called as APIs, application programming interfaces. So that once an open API is available, to NALSA or to the district or the state legal service authorities, you can retrieve every element of the information from the case information system, which maps data of crores of cases pending and disposed of, and then you can really divine, you can design your solutions. Now, at present, a great deal of work has been already done. The e-prison software has been developed by the Ministry of Home Affairs in conjunction with the National, Information, uh, National Informatics Center. And it has provided a mechanism to share the data of under trial prisoners, for instance, eligible under Section 436A of the CRPC, under trial prisoners who have been granted bail, but to whom release orders have not yet been given, convicted persons who are appeal, who are eligible for premature release, 
those who are entitled to but have not been provided with legal services. The e-committee is presently working on the integration of CIS with the e-prison software, and the information will also be available with courts for appropriate remedial measures. So we are in the process of designing, and I believe this will be uh, something which we look forward in the very immediate future, particularly in the light of the discussions of the last two days, is to develop a proper mechanism to maintain under trial prisoners' data, including the date of imprisonment, the act under which the arrest has taken place, the sections along with the maximum imprisonment provided for the offenses. We are also in the process of designing an alert mechanism for the judge regarding the status of under trials, including information about under trials who have undergone the period of imprisonment, vis-a-vis -vis the maximum punishment which is provided for the offense. The creation of a single window system for processing of all jail petitions of convicts and under trial prisoners. Defining timelines for every process which must be followed with alerts if those timelines are breached relating to under trial prisoners. Communication of bail orders and release warrants to the prisons and the police stations. And the mechanism to maintain details of every convict and every under trial. So among the if you were to just do a Google search on the e-prison software, you will find portals such as the Citizen Service Portal, the Prisoner Data to the Legal Services, the e-Parole Module, the e-Custody Certificate, the Prison Inmate Information as on the record, the e-Mulakat record, e-Parole Windows, the Grievance Submissions, and then Prisoner Data to the Legal Services Authorities. And finally, the e-custody certificates. So a huge amount of work is going on within the system. And I do believe that now the need, for the, uh, the need of the hour is for us to use technology to talk to each other. Talk to each other, not in person, but to use technology to link up our institutions so that those who are in need of justice do not have to access us, but that we provide access to all these people who are in need of justice. The NALSA, as well as the state and district legal services authorities, would really benefit very greatly by monitoring the status of convicts with the, uh, with the use of data on the national judicial data grid. Among the facilities for monitoring convicts which have been and are being developed on the NJDG, is the list of convicts lodged in various prisons under the jurisdiction of the respective high courts and the district courts. The name of the convict, prisoner ID, date of punishment, date of admission and jail, the nature of the punishment, the judgment, the warrant issued to the jail, interim orders, if any, have been passed. So these, this data will help us to identify convicts in need of legal aid and assistance. A very important facet of the work which we have to do is by special drives for training and outreach programs, both for citizens and advocates through the district legal services authorities and the Taluka legal services authorities. We have drawn up a training program for 2022. A very senior district, from, district judge from Tamil Nadu, Ms. Arun Mozi, who is, uh, uh, is, is member of human resources in our committee, is working on this. Now, a letter has been addressed to all the chief justices for accelerating the ICT awareness and outreach programs to all the state judicial academies. And all state judicial academies are proactively conducting the ICT drive. 18,858 stakeholders were covered through the state judicial academies during January and June 2022. Now, we have calendars, and our calendar accounts for district-level quarterly e courts programs at all district headquarters through the DLSAs, taluka-level quarterly e courts programs at all taluk levels through the taluka legal services authorities, and village-level e courts programs at 10 villages of each taluk to the Taluk Legal Services Authorities for Common Citizens and Litigants. Then we have special e-courts awareness programs for the DLSAs, PLP, the paralegal volunteers, and panel lawyers, and special drives for Taluka level advocates and e-court awareness programs at the Taluk and the village levels. So I'm using this opportunity to appeal to all of you to please participate in these programs, which are being made available across India in a bilingual mode 
in the language which can be easily accessed by citizens, by advocates, by law students. Finally, the law students. Law students in the fourth and fifth year are very, a, a very potent source for us to tap for the future. There is a deep divide in legal education in the country. At one end of the spectrum, you have the national law schools consisting of the best from different backgrounds. At the other end of the spectrum, you have law schools where there is barely any teaching. Some of them are student driven. Some of them only exist in name. But there is one thing which students across law schools share, and particularly students at the other end of the spectrum. And that important feature which they share is the awareness of reality. They may not have had the best of education in terms of their upbringing or background, but every one of them is deeply aware of the reality which exists in their villages and towns. Now it is therefore we have to tap these young law students before the system makes them desanitized to pain and suffering. I think the great problem of the legal profession and the great challenge to judging in today's times is that you get desensitized to pain. The young are not yet desensitized to pain. And therefore, we have to tap the young before they get desensitized. They become as wooden with probably age and the repeated interface with injustice. We have to allow these students to conduct legal awareness camps through video conferencing so that they can reach out to wider audiences. They can perhaps deal with the grant of preliminary legal advice. They are smart enough. And with a little bit of encouragement, these are the students who will be really the torchbearers for our future. Technology today has given us tools such as the Telegram channel. The Telegram channel is an instant messaging and unidirectional communication device through which you can load information, transmit information, but the information recipient cannot either edit or change the information which you load. Now, it is important for us, we have been very reticent. The Supreme Court has been very reticent. High courts are even more reticent. And the district courts who look up to the high courts are therefore even more reticent on the use of modern means of communication, including Twitter, the Telegram channel. I think this resistance to us to use means of communication have to change because we can reach out to our citizens by only using the language of discourse, which is today becoming so prevalent in society. Unless we, as judicial institutions, shed this resistance to adopting the means of communication which is so widespread in our society today, we would perhaps have lost the game. And I do believe we are already in the process of losing the game unless we shed this fear about what would happen if we use modern means of communication. That's been one of the, one of the great uh, reservations about adopting live streaming. Judges across the board feel, well, what happens if I start live streaming my court proceedings? Will people start becoming, will they start assessing us? Will we lose the sense of respect of the community if we live stream court proceedings? Yes, of course, some of us will lose the respect of the community. But we will lose the respect of the community by showing to the world at large how we conduct ourselves when we sit there on the dais. But that's also a reminder that we have to change the ways in which we have been functioning. There is a world of accountability at large. And I think we can earn the respect of the community at large, provided we adopt and come on to the platforms which are so prevalent in our society. The judicial institution cannot be left behind if we have to be the harbingers of change. Even in terms of the Lok Adalat module, the CIS, the case information software, allows for the Lok Adalat module in various fa facilities on the CIS itself. 
the allocation of the lok adalat assigning the name and date of the lok adalat assigning the members there is a facility to add names of judges advocates and other members in the panel of the lok adalat multiple panels can be created for a single lok adalat assign cases send notices to parties for settling lo lok adalat sends sms to smss to parties in a bilingual mode in a mode in the language which people understand assign cases to individual pan panels mark settlements of cases generation of reports archival of cases so i think it's i'll end really by saying that much of the work that we do is in the area of human interface but the danger of human interface must also be realized that we have not institutionalized the work which we do so much of the work which we do depends on the individual who is in charge of the institution and i think the greatest example of that is my very distinguished colleague who is sitting next to me because the legal services movement has been transformed since he took over just because of the sense of dynamism which just lalith has brought to it but i think what we need to do is to institutionalize what justice lalit has done i'm not sure we can clone we can't clone justice lalit but we can certainly institutionalize the work which he has done by looking for the future when we pass on the the baton which we have to succeeding generations of administrators i'm deeply deeply uh, deeply deeply grateful to justice lalit for having uh, invited me to uh, to through this platform which was truly uh, his baby and his uh, vision but it's been a great pleasure to meet all of you and to share a few thoughts yesterday thank you thank you justice chandrachur the dynamism is actually in this entire body the august gathering correct not in any individual now may i invite justice sanjay kishan call who has certain other perspectives and some very good ideas when it comes to mediation and some of the other issues just this call uh, brother lalit brother dr chandrachud my colleagues from the supreme court high court and really the judicial fraternity uh, it is important i think for all of us to understand that uh, Uh, there has to be a less of a hierarchy and a greater amount of understanding between the spectrum of people we are here to make a system work and it is also time that uh, for an out of box thinking for most things so the experiment which uh, brother lalit did was an out of box thinking uh, brother chandrachur talked about technology as a carry forward again is out of box from a traditional concept of a sense Uh, similarly i have been a great votary of uh, methodologies to think away from the normal system one number two utilize what are the tools available within the system also we offer in our routineness of work in our routineness of uh, thought process uh, don't even utilize the tools which are available whether it's under the civil procedure code or the criminal procedure code uh, the sheer volume of pendency to my mind is creating a impediment now if every case has to be tried till the end if every first appeal has to be heard by the courts if every matter trans, uh, transcends itself into coming to the supreme court why 200 years 500 years will also not see the end of this litigation so what is that uh, i believe in an out of box thinking which can come interaction of stakeholders was one thing which uh, brother lalit has done today and i hope all of you uh, carry back uh, uh, a sense of belonging and have shared thoughts how to do things differently we are a vast country we are a varied country we are more varied than the whole of europe combined together so when when people talk about judicial administration when they talk about political administration it's a great challenge the problem in different areas may be different which is something i said in the morning but from the thought process of others we can see how that particular problem which is prevalent in our area can be tackled uh, 
I believe the, the uh, see, you create a bypass in a heart surgery to, to provide some kind of a methodology. The judicial system also needs a bypass. The methodology to speed up the justice system and provide better justice, which the Legal Service Authority endeavors to do to a varied section of society, because we have a large marginalized section of society, also requires us to see that things are drawn out of the pipeline to get resolution at the first stage. And you are very, very crucial in that process. So the endeavor should be to, as much as possible, bring the litigation to a close at the first stage. There are cases, heinous cases, which must see the consequences by trial and the punishment to the regular person. But as is being said, is the process a punishment? Is keeping people behind bars the ultimate solution to a process which we are not able to conclude? These are big questions which are being raised. And I think it's necessary to change a mindset which is occurring. This is the mindset of prosecution which I mentioned in the morning. This is, a, if I may say so, a mindset also of, of all our brethren at times. Prosecution is not going to do its job. I know this fellow has done this. Let me keep him behind bars for the time period I can, even if I'm not able to convict. That's not a solution. If, if the prosecution has to do its job, it has to be more innovative. It has to be more scientific. Um, it has to use technology. One of the things flagged was the absence of FSL labs. I, I, one of you, you raised it, and I found it repeatedly. So in a recent case, a case of economic offense, somebody is behind bars for two and a half years. The investigation is not complete. They say, well, there's a lot of data, and the FSL is still processing it. If there's a lot of data, our country is a country where there is so much of... Uh, 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 software available, so much of manpower available for software to utilize that we should be doing so rather than just prolonging the case. So that mindset is something which needs to change and that's the reason I uh, mentioned uh, pre-bargaining in the beginning. Why has it not worked? I'm again emphasizing. One view is, uh, and people keep telling me, look, uh, the Indian society doesn't accept uh, so easily the stigma. But what is that part of society we are talking about? We are talking about people from economically, socially vulnerable society who, as it is, are sending many years in jail. Would they prefer to spend less years in jail and, and have a plea bargaining or spend more years in jail uh, and then uh, seek an acquittal? I think truly if asked and if they've actually been guilty of the offense, whether they prove it or not, they would be, according to me, more than willing to go through a plea, plea bargaining. But the system has not been able to uh, guide them or make them aware of plea bargaining. So as uh, Mr. Vishwanathan said in the morning, it is necessary that the judges and the defense system which is now being set up consciously makes available this plea bargaining mechanism to them and makes them aware of it. This is one aspect of the matter I wanted to touch. And along with plea bargaining is also mediation. Now, as I believe, and Brother Lalith has been the real brain behind nothing, and I was talking to him, are there civil cases where the mediation plays a role? He said, well, largely it's criminal. Something which is of concern uh, to all of us is that the, in a country perspective, it's not the growth of civil litigation, but the growth of criminal litigation, which is more troublesome. But the growth of criminal litigation is also because the pace of adjudication of civil litigation is very, very low. So people look to the civil and criminal ramification of it and feel going through a suit trial may take its own time. And therefore, let us try to pin him on the criminal side and he will come and settle. So objective is ultimately to settle. I'm not talking about hardcore criminal cases. But look at uh, uh, something like the family disputes. I call it a bouquet of cases is filed. The lawyers are expertise in a bouquet of cases, standard cases, which are filed. When these bouquet of cases come, they have a civil case, they have a criminal case. And that is why in, in mediations or even in plea bargaining at times, one, I feel, can arrive at a solution to put an end to this bouquet of cases. So to that extent, plea bargaining and mediation have to work hand in hand to tackle the different aspects of the civil and criminal litigation. 
if we have to see an uh, early adjudication. Uh, I also believe that uh, there is a distinction between a less heinous offenses and a more heinous offense. It's time we completely think out of the box to bring an end to, you know, one-time measures to some way of executive and judicial actions for putting, say, offenses of seven years or less in a different category, even up to 10 years. Treat the lifetime sentence cases separately. And how to get it out of the system so that all of you are able to concentrate on the more heinous offense cases. The time you devote to a local dalat, to a mediation, to a plea bargaining, please appreciate, you may feel that, well, this is a time being spent on this, I could do a trial. Sometimes people feel, what kind of units will I give for my performance? But a successful endeavor at this, even by a 50% percentage, not only brings the whole thing to an end at that stage, saves the further forums of judicial scrutiny, and possibly sends back the party without making the process a tiresome one itself. So, uh, this is also to be considered in the conspectus of something uh, which Brother mentioned about the low conviction rates. Why is it there low conviction rate? Because the investigation is a problem, a testimony is a problem, you get stock witnesses, people get away by speaking untruths so that you don't have time, so nobody faces a, a prosecution for perjuries. Uh, very, very eminent uh, people in countries abroad would dare not get into the witness walk and speak the untruth because the consequences are very, very severe. Here we seem to get away with it again and again. Um, stock witnesses are utilized. So, what is the purpose of having a low conviction rate in a large population as under trial prisoners who will, at the end of the day, possibly get acquittal. So if you have 30% conviction, it means 70% people are being acquitted. And those 70 people, percent people are also spending a long time in jail. See, it is not our job to be the prosecutor. It's the prosecutor's job to be the prosecution. We can't do anything unless the prosecution performs its job. To say that people get away and so we should keep them behind bars through this convoluted process, if I may say so, is with respect not the solution. Even uh, it was mentioned that there has to be, uh, you know, realization of a victimology principle. Yes, I also believe that uh, uh, the victim has a has um, is a responsibility towards the victim. But there are more in heinous cases. Let us say somebody has had a hurt, offense of hurt, offense even of grievous hurt at times. Uh, you will see by passage of time a lot of matters come there. Settlement is arrived at, at the Supreme Court stage. Will they say, okay, compensation is a methodology, maybe. The procedure of compensation is available. The question is, do we utilize it in these kind of cases, which are not the, not the life sentence cases? Therefore, I am telling all of you and large number of you, please try to bring these litigations to an end by whatever method is possible, which is provided in the tools and maybe sometimes a little out of the tool situation. Yes, of course, don't give less than the maximum sentence for an appellate court to interfere. That's not when I'm saying the out of the box thinking is that. You are constrained by law. All of us are constrained by law. So we have to work within the legal parameters. But there's enough play within the legal parameters to be able to arrive at a situation where we are able to work out solutions. And legal service authority is a tool to assist in that process. If you are able to give legal help to somebody and in the process agree on a plea bargaining and get him out of the system, I think that's a, that's a great uh, service done. Um, Examples of this, sometimes we have been emphasizing that the legal authority should also be looking to people who have been in a prison for long times. And there have been cases coming up where the legal assistance is in the form of filing an appeal while the person is almost convicted the whole sentence. Then that he should have a chance for acquittal by filing an appeal is one thing. That his case should go for remission is another aspect of the matter. And these two are mutually exclusive in that sense. But often what I found is that 
matters go through a tier, sometimes there's a formality going through it. You know there is, uh, there is no real merit in the appeal, but you want to go through the process so that a quietness is put to the Supreme Court by it. While possibly moving on the remission side, putting, uh, moving the re requisite application, assisting that person. And that's why uh, the Legal Service Authority in one of the judicial administered matters before me has, I think, done a wonderful job in taking up state-wise how many cases remission can take place, how work can be done. And this material and data collected is some kind of an information which will flow to you to use at the ground level. So what are we doing? We are collaborating in a manner. What Brother Chandishu talked about was information and technology. Uh, Brother Lalit is leading a process. I'm saying utilize the processes available and the alternatives to the processes in the system to ultimately see a reasonable resolution to a dispute because there is no idealistic situation. We are not in a position to give some kind of an ideal solution, but give a practical solution to the whole problem of this thing. I'm sure you will all uh, carry with you good memories of your interactions here and carry a message how to do these things maybe in a different, innovative, in a better manner, learning from each other as we learn from you and you learn from us. This is an ongoing process. We hope we are able to carry on this process because, as Brother put, whether it's environment or judiciary or in something else, add on and give a little further. If a lot of it has been done now, let's keep trying to add on something to it so that uh, when successes take over, they in turn add on. And that's how a cascading effect takes place. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are now coming to the closing moments of this one and a half day conference. As Justice Call put it, it's a learning process. It's a learning process for all of us. To me, at least, it was definitely. I couldn't have asked for anything greater than this, where persons coming from judicial officers coming from every district of the country. There can't be better representation of Indian judiciary than this particular gathering. So here we see what Indian judiciary comprises of, the foundation of Indian judiciary. And it was very, very enjoyable, very enriching experience, which I'll always cherish this. And I take it that it was equally satisfying and fruitful for all of you. We go back with these memories with greater vigor that we will now actually encounter whatever the problems are, whatever the ideals that we want to achieve, we'll be striving to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. एक मिनट सुराना जी प्लीज बैठिए प्लीज बैठिए आप बैठिए प्लीज आप प्लीज बैठिए हाँ हाँ सर एक मिनट आप बैठिए प्लीज माय लॉर्ड इफ इफ परमिटेड मे आई प्रपोज वोट ऑफ थैंक्स I know uh, that th this is time for lunch, even if I will take five more minutes. A very good afternoon to all. On behalf of everyone, I am honored to be standing here to propose vote of thanks. I extend my heart, heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, for accepting our invitation and gracing the inaugural cer ceremony as the chief guest. I express my thanks to Honorable Mr. Justice N. V. Ramanna, the Chief Justice of India and Pattern in Chief Nalsa for being a guiding light uh, for us and also gracing the inaugural session. I extend my gratitude to Sri Kiran Dijujuji, Honorable Union Minister for Law and Justice for always supporting legal services institution in their initiatives. 
Now, I am proposing vote of thanks to for men in action. And Mr. Surana was rushing here for his standing ovation to Honorable Mr. Justice Lalit Saab. In his own words of the Lordships, may it be 12.30 in the night or quarter to 12 when I, I pass on message to his Lordship. Lordship say, okay, come on just now. I'm waiting. I quote in the words of Lordship, uh, his Lordship used to tell us, you quit you lose. You keep going, you may still lose, but your ambition will never die. I wish to express my sincere, sincere thank to Honorable Mr. Justice Uday Umesh Lalitji just Supreme Court of India and Executive Chairman Nalsa, without whose support and guidance, the event would not have been a resounding success and created its history. I express my thanks to Honorable Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachur Saab, just Supreme Court of India. Who is always a motivating factor in, in digital initiatives and will be there for longer time for Judiciary of India. I express my sincere thanks to Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishanji Call, who is a crusader, crusader for prisoners' rights and still lots of, in lots of appeals or SLPs, just uh, guiding us to work for convicts and also UTPs. Thank you, my lord. I express my thanks to Hon Honorable Mr. Justice B.R. Gavai Saab, Honorable Mr. Justice Ajay Rastogi ji, and Honorable Mr. Justice P.S. Narsimha ji for sparing their valuable time and giving us deep insight about the issues pertaining to making the present legal system even more effective and advanced. I express my gratitude to Honorable Judges Supreme Court for gracing the occasion by attending the inaugural and valedictory sessions. I express my gratitude to Honorable the Chief Justice of Ilabad, Honorable the Chief Justice Telangana, Honorable Executive Chairman Jharkhand and Assam. Who is participated in four technical sessions and guided us. I also thank senior members of the bar Shri K. V. Vishwanathan ji, Shri Siddharth Luthra ji, Shri Shram Divan ji for participating and guiding us in technical sessions. I also express my gratitude to Shri a Justice A. P. Sahi ji, Director of National Judicial Academy. I would like to express my sincere thanks to all member secretaries of state legal services authorities in 
a historic event like this, the first All India District Legal Services Authority meet cannot happen overnight. The wheel started rolling weeks ago. I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to complete their respective task, even if some names which I remember, I want to express my thank to them. They are officials of PMO, Department of Justice, Office of Honorable Chief Justice of India, Honorable Executive Chairman, and the uh, government offices like Department of Post, etc. I sincerely thank to certain hotel managements who supported us very well, the catering staff and catering people of ITDC, the transport people, the event team. I also want to express my gratitude and thanks to SPG and Delhi Police. My sincere uh, thank to NALSA and SLSA teams, all technical and data team, and also sincere thank to mentors and individuals who worked behind the well. Before ending, uh, may I request all of you to please rise for national anthem. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Kavira, Ukkala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachala, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Nami, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mange, Gahe, Tava, Jaya, Gatha, Janagana Mandala Dayaka Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you, thank you. The lunch is arranged at foyer at NXC building and also atrium. Three instances of lunch ki arrangement hai, foyer, atrium, or NXC building. Mein. Thank you very much. Fir milenge alvida. Thank you.